Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 403, 503, Digital Rhetoric, uh, with me, Dr. Matt Barton. Uh, and in this chapter, we'll be looking uh, very briefly here at a rather beefy chapter. You know, this is Doug Iman's Digital Rhetoric book, Chapter 2 on Digital Rhetoric, colon, Theory. And I don't know how familiar or how experienced you are reading theory. Uh, of course, he's just glossing over some theories here from other people. Uh, but it can be quite a struggle. It can be... You know, uh, impenetrable, <laughs> you know, depending on the theorist in question. And so I just like to preface chapters like this by saying, you know, if you struggle with this, if you didn't get everything, don't feel bad. Uh, it's definitely not you. Uh, you know, frankly, there's plenty in here that I had to really <laughs> read several times and uh, do a little background research to try to figure out what was going on in that section. Uh, so just you never ever want to start feeling like you don't belong or that you're excluded or you're not good enough or anything like that. Uh, just keep in mind, a lot of this will get easier with time and as you become familiar with more and more of the context uh, of the field and all these people that I'm referring to and that they're referring to and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but anyway, my goal in this lecture here will be just to quickly go through some of these concepts. I'll see if I can give you some of my own examples maybe uh, put things in a different way to help you to understand. We'll, we'll see how far we can get with that. Uh, but it is, again, a long chapter, so I don't know how far how far we will get. We'll try our best, though. All right, so he starts off here talking about digital rhetoric, and he says uh, it should be viewed as a field that engages multiple theories and methods rather than as a singular theory framework. So really, this should not be digital rhetoric colon theory. It should be digital rhetoric colon theories. Because uh, really, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. And I think part of the motivation here is, uh, even if he, he knows better, I guess Iman isn't so uh, full of himself or ambitious or, or whatever word you want to use, uh, that he would even attempt to say, like, here is the theory that everybody should use. <laughs> you know, uh, Nobody would ever go for that. It's it's too open. Uh, there's too many com competing theories, I suppose. And you know, frankly, it's just not, it's just not organized uh, the way. There, there's not like an approved way of going about the research, as you might find in, in, in the sciences. And a lot of this whole digital rhetoric and rhetoric. You know, if you've ever been curious about some of these different departments uh, that used to be just English like linguistics and, and, and uh, communication studies. And there's a lot of different, uh, you might call them sub-disciplines or side-disciplines or other disciplines uh, than just the regular English uh, field. And a lot of that has to do with how scientific you want to be. Right? So like, if you want to use a scientific method and empirical research and do like <laughs> studies that would kind of hold up in uh, the court of science, uh, you know, you go one one direction, uh, but the the rhetoric is uh, you know pretty far removed <laughs> from that model. Uh, and instead, I think we're probably a little bit more like some of the, uh, I guess maybe like continental philosophers. Uh, we know we like to use a mix of old, really old stuff like Aristotle and Plato and Isocrates, as well as a uh, newer stuff. But you really won't find too many. Uh, empirical type studies done on, on this side of that, uh, of that break, if you will. You know, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I, I don't really have an opinion on it. It's just a, a different way. Uh, anyway, we, we're going to look at quite a few classical rhetoricians in this chapter. And they talked about Isocrates here, who's known for his uh, work, I think it's called the Antithesis. You know, I always liked Isocrates because he uh, was focused on creating future leaders, you know, great civic leaders. That was his, his uh, focus. <laughs> you know, so it was let, let's learn how to speak and communicate really well and have a good sense of ethics uh, so we can go out there and change the world in positive ways. Right? It's kind of an uh, early pioneer in that. And by the way, his program lasted for four years. <laughs> You know, by uh, contrast, you study with Plato, it was all about this, this sort of philosophizing back and forth, um, you know, questioning everything to death, basically. And his, his program took 20 years. <laughs> uh, so you can see kind of where the priorities were there. And I think uh, 
you know, Aristotle to me is it's kind of like the ultimate nerd. You know, just all information was great for him. And I just loved uh, collecting all this data, kind of like the, a human database. <laughs> and so I just kind of see those as, it's kind of fun to think about, uh, you know, what was going on back then. Uh, but anyway, what can they teach us about digital rhetoric? And we've already covered some of it, but here uh, Eilman really goes into, uh, you know, like, how can we understand something like, I like to use the example of Twitter or uh, wikis. You know, if we think about Twitter, in some ways it is like writing. You know, it's like a book, right? You have text that you're reading. <laughs> but it, there's so much more going on there. It's not really much like a book. It might superficially look like reading a newspaper article or something like that, but you quickly discover uh, that it's more of a, it's almost more like a dialogue. It's more like a discussion, right? With a, you, Somebody tweets something, somebody uh, replies to it, but you also have these other this other stuff going on, like the retweeting and, and the liking, uh, and then there, somebody replies to a part of another tweet. You know, and it, it kind of gets kind of complicated pretty quick. Uh, so some people have said, well, you know, maybe one way we could uh, study this is by let's go back to like Plato's dialogues, because he's got a lot of dialogues uh, where he talks about rhetoric and, and uh, writing and. What's, you know, what's the proper way to get at the truth of something, this, this Socratic method or the, or the dialectic? And we could say that Twitter, maybe Twitter kind of fits Plato's ideal in ways that are kind of weird to think about, but <laughs> you know, maybe Plato would actually like Twitter uh, more because it doesn't have these same faults as these uh, scripts or scrolls. And one of the problems that Plato had with writing was that people could just memorize a speech that somebody else had written, and they could give that speech, and it would sound like they really knew what they were talking about. You know, like an actor. <laughs> you know, you could have an actor give the actor a script about atomic fusion or something, and the actor could memorize that speech and deliver it in a very convincing, natural way. And you think, wow, this person must be a you know nuclear physicist. <laughs> when then the reality was, hey, they might not, they might not understand a single word of the speech, right? They've just uh, they've got that ability. And so Plato slash Socrates, Socrates was the character that Plato wrote about, was his teacher, Socrates. Uh, you know, Plato said writing is, that's, that's one of the problems, right? You had this appearance of knowing what you're talking about, but you can't really talk back. You can't have a debate about it. You know, if you talk to that actor, start asking the actor questions, you know, quickly you'd realize it's just an actor. <laughs> Not a real doctor. I just play one on TV, All right, right? That sort of problem. Uh, so you could say, you could look at that dialogue and say, well, look, again, Twitter, uh, you know, you can, you can read the tweet and you can ask a question. You get a follow up pretty much instantly, you know, assuming that the person on the other end is there. Uh, so you could say that's a little bit closer to this um, Socratic model. So maybe we need to go back and rethink. You know, maybe there's some other insights in here we, we could talk about in, in debate. So it's like even this, this old, old debate, <laughs> you know, 5th century BCE kind of has relevance uh, all these years later. Totally different concept. You know, we're not talking about these scrolls. We're talking about Twitter. And yet, you know, some of the stuff still, still seems to apply. Uh, so that's, a lot of scholars like to do that kind of work. Uh, you know, he's got other dialogues, of course. Uh, and then the canons of classical rhetoric. Uh, here we're talking about this this method of learning rhetoric that again has been around all throughout ancient times, through the Middle Ages, up to and through the Renaissance, and all, all, practically all the way through the Enlightenment. Although, as we saw last time, there were some philosophers uh, that wanted to separate out rhetoric from from science, but uh, <clears throat> or logic. But but anyway, the uh, this method of invention, there's a little table here somewhere. All right, so if you were studying rhetoric in ancient times or in the Renaissance or whatever, they would have, you'd learn about invention, which is, you know, the material for the speech. How do you come up with that material, the content? <laughs> you know, what's the word count? Oh, my God, I need a thousand words. <laughs> Where are those words going to come from? Uh, that'd be the invention phase. Uh, the arrangement pretty self-explanatory, you know, what should you put in the intro, what should you save until the end, you know, there's various ways of organizing the information for maximum impact. Style, you know, you want something formal, humorous, you know, lighthearted, uh, serious, you know, all that sort of thing. 
uh, delivery. Uh, yeah, the, the, the are you speaking in a monotone, are you whispering, <laughs> shouting? Uh, what about those hand gestures, facial gestures? Um, and then memory, you know, how do you memorize the speech? You know, just to harken back to Plato for a minute. You know, the uh, they didn't want you, especially back in these times, you might have to go up into a courtroom and you didn't have a lawyer there, uh, but you could get somebody to write a speech for you. And then the idea was you'd memorize the speech that they wrote, this professionally written uh, speech. Uh, but you couldn't bring the script with you. <laughs> so you had to memorize it. And then also, you know, just like with the, today, uh, you might be reading off a teleprompter, but, you know, the, if it's done well, you don't want to draw too much attention to the teleprompter, right? You shouldn't even notice that the person is doing that. It's just people that are bad at uh, delivery uh, where you really notice that they're reading off that teleprompter. Uh, but I think, you know, of course, they didn't have teleprompters uh, back in this period. You know, some people don't think we should have them today, you know, frankly. You know, uh, but, but anyway, uh, you'd want to memorize, back then especially, you'd want to memorize the speech, but then you also had to be able to deliver it uh, from memory in a natural way so it didn't sound like you were just reading off a script. Uh, just kind of like with an actor. You know, you don't really notice somebody's acting unless they're a bad actor, and then it becomes obvious they're just reading lines. <laughs> you know, same sort of thing here. Uh, and that was a lot of rhetorical training would help you to be able to read that. or How, to me how, do, how do you memorize it? You know, we learn mnemonics in the garden. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of mental sort of exercises you can use to help you remember things. Uh, but then being able to deliver it, you know, in a convincing, natural way was a big part of rhetoric. Uh, so a lot of scholars like to go back to this canon and say, okay, uh, you know, some of this stuff needs to be updated, basically, if we're talking about digital rhetoric, uh, you know, blogging, for example, or YouTube video, uh, whatever the case may be, but maybe some of it still kind of applies, and we can just sort of adapt this time-tested <laughs> method. I mean, this was around forever. You know, all the... You know, every George Washington, Jefferson, all those folks, they would have, they would have learned this traditional method. Uh, it's still pretty much used today in a lot of college, uh, you know, classrooms, right? And so the idea is instead of let's not just reinvent the the wheel. <laughs> let's just look at this method and see if we could kind of update it uh, so that it works for these uh, newer uh, modalities, or if you want to use a fancy word, or you know, websites. You know, can you use this stuff. To make a good tw uh, tweet, and I, I would say yes, and that's what they talk about in here is kind of how you can uh, adapt these things, like the the invention. Uh, they talk about this in conjunction with archives. And at some point in here, uh, databases comes up. They talk there about social bookmarking. You know, so one of the ways you write a, you know, you come up with material for your blog. You know, you Google information, right? <laughs> <laughs> you don't necessarily have to have everything in your brain. Uh, you have all sorts of ways to reach out and, you know, pull information from all this multitude of uh, sources. Uh, and then the arrangement, you know, the, you know, you think of that about that traditionally, like you got, well, the introduction, the body, the uh, whatever, but they have it a little bit more in depth here. Let's see where they talk about the, uh, yeah. Uh, with the digital side, it gets a little more interesting because, um, you can interact with, uh, right? If you have a, uh, a blog, you can have links uh, in that blog and people could, uh, they could just read it start to finish or they might, you know, skip around, they might search it, uh, they might use those links and that might take them to another, another page and, and then come back. And so there's a lot more, uh, you know, it's not like the audience is just sitting there, sitting back, you know, listening as you get from point A to point B. <laughs> you know, they, they actually have a little bit more control over how they, you know, the arrangement is not just purely what the author wants. You know, the uh, the audience can do this in uh, different orders, you know, databases. You know, and you see this, you know, oddly enough in video games as well. A lot of gamers will criticize the game. They'll say, that's too linear. Or, There's only one way through this game. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they want to be able to make their own decisions and maybe they want to go to this level instead of that level, you know, and do it in this different order. Uh, they talk about the sandbox game where you kind of do whatever you want to when you want to. Uh, so that's an example. You could talk about something like that in terms of arrangement. 
you know, this classical rhetorical canon is, is pretty cool. Uh, style is another one. You know, a lot of people think about style as being about word choice. You know, is it formal? Is it informal? Is it fancy? Is it elegant? <laughs> uh, is it eloquent? But, uh, again, coming back to like a blog, uh, we could be talking about things like the design of it. You know, does it have a, what kind of font are you using? I mean, think, I think about a font. You've got fonts that look kind of like cursive, you know, real fancy. You got fonts that kind of look like, you know, they, they were spray painted on a brick wall, kind of almost a graffiti style. Of course, you've got the, like the comic sans. <laughs> uh, so you could say that kind of has a, you know, that, that's sort of a, a key part of this, right? You know, the blog, you, you, if you chose to use that Comic Sans font, uh, that's a font, but I, arguably that kind of affects the meaning of it, right? The, the way you read that is going to be different. It's going to seem, I would say, probably a little bit more lighthearted, a little, little informal in that Comic Sans font uh, than if it... I mean, imagine if this book was written in, like, Comic Sans or... <laughs> <laughs> you know, some really decorative font with a bunch of wing dings and so on and so forth. That would affect the uh, the performance of the speech, if you will, right? So, or the blog. The way you react to that blog would be different. Your color, uh, the layouts. So, again, it seems like brand new stuff. Like, they weren't talking about fonts, <laughs> you know, and headers, images, and things. Uh, and the look of a hyperlink back in uh, ancient Rome or Greece, but yet you know, arguably the similar sorts of things apply. Uh, you could look at the advice they were giving back then and say, well, well, maybe that would make sense. Let's see what is here. Oh, yeah, style and substance. So what they're talking about there is, uh, again, especially in the Enlightenment, forward, uh, a lot of those uh, scientists, <laughs> science writers, you know, people like Bacon, Francis Bacon, we're saying we need to come away from this eloquence and elegance, you know, just be really clear. We don't want to get our, you know, we, you know, brief, sincere, and clear, you know, is the goal. Clarity is, is the goal. You, know? <laughs> you don't want any of this fancy, schmancy, uh, flowery prose getting in the way of the, of the meat. You know, what, what does this mean? You know, what, what is the, uh, the substance uh, don't give me the style, uh, you know, give me the substance. So a lot of modern uh, rhetoricians have looked at that and say, they say, it doesn't make any sense to try to separate style and, and substance, you know. Uh, they're really interwoven. Uh, or maybe it's kind of the, the same thing, even. Uh, you know, can you really separate the meaning of something from the language that you use to communicate that something? <laughs> you know, and uh, arguably... You, you, know, you really can't. They're, they're kind of too uh, closely related, or maybe they're even the same thing. Kind of a philosophical thing I, I won't go into here, but you know, other than to say it's a little muddier uh, than you might have thought. You know, memory is another one. Again, they come back to this idea of the digital mnemonics or um, archiving and storage. You know, we really don't have to remember all this stuff uh, when you can just easily Google it. You know, that, that can be part of what they mean by memory. Um, I think they, they might talk in here a little bit about yeah the location of information. I thought they talked in here about uh, uh, I'm looking for it, but like the search the search feature of a website. You know when you hit Control F or whatever, you know you might remember like a little bit of a phrase or a little bit of a word. Uh, so you might search, you know, search the Kindle version of the book. Uh, maybe you search for Kathy Gossip. So I can kind of remember that she's in here somewhere, uh, but I don't remember exactly what page she's on. So I, I, again, do the search algorithm and, you know, whip right to it. So you could talk about that in terms of memory um, instead of this idea of just memorizing something. Uh, you can also talk about it in terms of like these archives and the databases again. I like to think about it, too, in terms of uh, mem memorable, you know, something memorable. You know, does it stick with you after you put it down? You know, there's you can use a lot of those memory tricks that they were talking about in ancient times to make something more memorable. You know, easy example of that is repetition. <laughs> you know, so if you want to memorize something, you just repeat it over and over and over again. And so they use that concept uh, when they're designing interfaces uh, for apps, you know, whatever the case may be. They try to make it use a certain amount of repetition 
uh, so that you can, uh, you know, maybe you've never seen that particular icon before, but they use the same border around it, the same colors and things of that sort, so you know that you sort of have a basic idea of what it does. You know, it looks like it kind of fits in, or maybe you see like the uh, little pair of scissors, and you know, you just remember from other contexts that that means uh, copy or cut, you know, things of that sort. Uh, so they use a lot of those same those same ideas to make this interface easier to, <laughs> uh, to remember how to use it, basically. Uh, and then delivery, uh, you know, we, we could talk about a lot of different ways that could apply. You know, good, you know, if you're talking about YouTube and a video, and a, you, know, you, you can have your body there and you could still be using literally the same stuff, the body language, the, the voice, you know, avoiding the monotone. <laughs> it could be just using it verbatim. Uh, or you could be thinking about, uh, let's see, how do they talk, what do they talk about in here? The discussion space, the medium of the conversation. Yeah, how it circulates. I thought there was an example here that access, you know, comes up a lot in this. You know, how do you access it? How is the information delivered to you? <laughs> uh, oh, come on. That's gonna, there's, I know there's an example here that made a lot of sense to me. In transitive constitutive performance, it's debatable whether a new media exists outside of performance. Ah, yes, yeah, so this, uh, with this piece, Brooke, um, if they're talking about a performance, and is it really the same thing if it's not a performance? So the example I came up with for this is a wiki, you know, like Wikipedia, being the one most people know about. So I've made this argument before that uh, if you printed out a page from Wikipedia, right? If, like you look up the Wikipedia article about ostriches or whatever, and you printed that out, is that really the wiki? <laughs> you know, again, it sounds like I'm being just flipping here weird, but you know, if you think about it, it kind of, uh, you know, I would say that's not really the wiki because you can't, now that it's printed out, you can't, can't edit that you know, page, you, you can't discuss it on the discussion tab like you could with wiki, you know, it's still going to be the same, you know, I mean, it'll erode over time, of course, you know, but, <laughs> you know, you come back in uh, a couple of weeks and you pull out that printout, it's going to be the same words there, uh, whereas if you go into the Wikipedia page, it, they, they might have changed it a hundred times, you know, since it was uh, printed out, you know, so there, I think it's kind of what they're getting at here, right, the uh, the wiki, to be a wiki, it has to be kind of performing itself. Just kind of a way to say it's, it's kind of alive. <laughs> it's alive! Uh, whereas that, uh, the printing is kind of like this fossil. <laughs> you know, that's, that's kind of like a snapshot of what Wikipedia was like. You know, like a, instead of a living system, you know, it's like a little plate uh, of what it looked like at a certain certain period. That's, that's kind of a long-winded way to think about this, but it does kind of get you thinking about some of these real important differences between standard text, you know, printed out on a page, or, you know, static, uh, a PDF, uh, versus something that's just, you can just edit at any time, on the fly, you know, much less a Twitter. You know, you get on Twitter sometimes, that thing is like... <laughs> it's like going so quickly, you can barely keep up with it. Uh, so you had to like pause and then you can read it and then you know advance a little bit further and so very different uh you know in some sense very different than anything practiced in ancient times but on the other hand maybe not so different you know especially when you get into like questions and answers <laughs> uh you, know, you think about you go to hear a speech and there might be uh after the speech that q a uh segment you know and again if those are done well uh, there's a certain amount of spont spontaneity that has to happen there for that to seem uh, natural all right, digital rhetoric and contemporary rhetorical theory. Uh, so here we, you know, putting aside the Rome, Roman stuff, the Greek stuff, moving into people like Foucault, Derrida, Cavino, Deleuze, and Guattari. <laughs> you know, very, uh, some of those folks um, can just be uh, really just bewildering. You know, very confusing uh, to sit down and try to read those. And of course, that's kind of the point, let's face it, to a certain degree, especially with... <laughs> <laughs> you know, somebody like Derrida, you know, whose stated purpose is like, you know, let's not be, you know, the whole idea of clear writing is kind of a delusion, right? This stuff's a lot, language is a lot weirder than you might have thought. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, so some of it's pretty far out to be 
honest with you about it. But uh, on the other hand, a lot of it's very, very useful and very insightful, and it really makes you think about things in a, a different way, uh, maybe a more in-depth way. And so he gets in this, this rhetorical situation section. This is, I guess, 1968 was when this was proposed. And you still hear these terms used all the time. Uh, I hear them used all the time here in the English department. Uh, when students are writing thesis, theses and they're writing uh, argument, argumentative essays, a lot of times the professors will say uh, things like, where's the exigence? <laughs> you know, the so what question. It's like, what the heck does that mean? Exigence. Well, it comes back to this 1968 article by Lloyd uh, Bitzer. I mean, he's obviously not talking about digital rhetoric in that, but he's talking about like, what, what is a rhetorical situation? You know, at what point is something rhetorical or not? It might be the way to think about this. You know, uh, and he's got a very specific answer to this. Let me see if I can get to this. So to be a rhetorical situation, it has to have this thing called exigence, uh, which exigence is a specific need and uh, a problem that requires a response. An imperfection marked by urgency it is a defect, an obstacle, something waiting to be done, a thing which is other than it should be, and so on and so forth. So the idea is you, people don't, it's not a rhetorical problem if there's nothing you can do about it, or there's, there's nothing really here that needs to be changed. <laughs> there's no just, just for the fun of it, uh, just for the sake of an exercise type uh, thing. Instead, there has to be some kind of thing we can point at and say, look, there's a problem. Uh, we need to solve this problem. Uh, and it's rhetorical if, you know, it's capable or the audience there, the people that you're talking to about it, can do something about it, right? They must be capable of being influenced by the discourse and of being mediators of change. Uh, so if you study marketing, for example, or sales, and you know, they talk there about, uh, you know, who can actually make the decision, who's the decision maker? All right, who, who, who's got the power <laughs> to actually buy the thing or make that purchasing decision? And the reason that's important, obviously, is that that's the person you really have to uh, impress, right? With, you know, you got to be, really be focused on them. Uh, if, if the person can't afford the car and there's no way the person can, can buy that car, it's just not a possibility, uh, there's no point. It's not a rhetorical situation at that point, right? Because there's, there's no way that person is not capable of buying the car, no matter how good the speech is, <laughs> you might have the best sales pitch in the world, but it's not rhetorical uh, because that person is not in a position to actually buy the car. Uh, so Bitzer, you know, would point that out, you know, as being a, a little problem in that rhetorical situation, right? And then, you know, like the constraints, you know, what can they do? What can't they do? And the, you know, you see this time and time again and all this, uh, digital rhetorical stuff because they'll be talking about affordances and constraints being like the opposites of each other. You know, the affordance is the button that lets you do something. Uh, the constraint might be, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe you got a PDF file and for whatever reason, uh, it won't let you print it. <laughs> There's like a little toggle thing that they, whoever created that document has set some, for some reason, uh, or maybe you can only send it to certain people, or maybe you can't send it at all. Uh, so that would be a constraint uh, in terms of the digital world. But, you know, for Bitzer, it's just uh, you know, persons, events, objects, and relations which are parts of the situation because they have the power to constrain decision and action needed <laughs> to modify the, the exigence. Uh, so, again, coming back to our car example, again, you know, maybe one of the constraints might be... Uh, Oh, your mom or your dad is like, not that car. <laughs> you know, we won't, you know, if you, you, you can't get that, or maybe the constraint might be uh, your garage, right? And say, so you can't get that truck because the garage is too short. <laughs> the truck is, you know what I'm saying? Like the truck wouldn't fit into the, your garage. You say that's a constraint. Um, kind of a silly example, but I, you know, I think it applies there. So naturally, people have torn Bitzer's work to shreds. <laughs> they say, no, this is all wrong. <laughs> it doesn't matter if the person, uh, you know, like the audience, it doesn't matter if they can do anything about it or not. It could still be rhetoric. And, you know, pretty much every part of what Bitzer said has been, you know, people have argued with it. You know, I don't really see any reason for us to spend a lot of time on that. 
but you know, just be aware that not everybody agrees <laughs> with Pitzer. <laughs> Although the, the the exigence bit seems to have stuck. You know, there's no point in writing a paper uh, if there's nothing that anybody can do about it. If there's if there's no problem to be solved, uh, why even bother with that topic? You know, that, that's something that stuck with us, I think, from from Bitzer. Um, let's see. Uh, where are we at this point? Uh, I think we're still talking about, yeah, the rhetorical situation. And how does this apply to the digital realm? You know, what is the rhetorical situation? There's, there's a lot of weird stuff with uh, once you move online. Uh, for example, in an online situation, a lot of the times you're anonymous. Uh, you know, they, they can't see you. Uh, <laughs> you could be anybody. You might not even be human. Uh, this a lot of times you see a tweet. Uh, guess what? That tweet wasn't actually written by a person. Uh, that was written. That was that's a machine. That's a that's a program. <laughs> You're interacting with a, with a program. Uh, with, they call them a bot. Uh, so that's something that seems a you know, pretty far removed. You know, I have to consider that sort of thing. You know, is that a rhetorical situation if you're arguing with a chat bot? Um, you, know, you know, that's kind of fun to think about. But, you know, it, it, it does help, I think, to go back to Bitzer's model and be thinking about, well, what can be changed? How does this apply to these uh, digital realms like, like a wiki or the, or the tweets? Yeah, here's one. The class, I like this line. Pache, or Pache re redesigns the classical rhetorical triangle you know, audience, purpose, and uh, speaker. Uh, so instead of a triangle, it's an atom. And all the elements are in motion, like, you know, electrons and, pro you know, all that stuff. It's moving around the electron cloud. <laughs> I don't know how useful it is, but it's a, it's a fun way to think about this stuff, I think. Yeah, the instability of the web itself, sites constantly vanishing and moving. You know, he talked a lot in here about the ecology, ecological systems might be a good way to think about this. And, you know, everything like, uh, you know, the butterfly flaps its wings and causes a, you know, hurricane over here. <laughs> you, know, it's, you know, it's almost that level. Um, but, you know, it certainly makes sense, I think, to always come back to the people. And one of the problems with uh, digital rhetoric, a lot of times it's easy to get so fixated on the technology uh, that you forget about the people, <laughs> you know, people using uh, the software. You know, I always think about Google. Uh, you know, Google was jealous, I guess, of Twitter and Facebook, you know, getting all the attention. So they created their own uh, version of that. They called it, what's it called? Google Circle or Google uh, something or another. Uh, but I just remember that kind of came and went. <laughs> you know, a lot of people liked it. You know, it's good technology. You know, I played around with it. It was easy. I thought it was in a lot of ways better just in terms of the interface and the way that it worked. Uh, it had better privacy controls and so on and so forth, but it just didn't ever catch on. And, you know, you can't just blame it on the technology or say, well, people were just too dumb to use it or, you know, nothing. <laughs> you, know, you really can't say that. Uh, you'd really have to be thinking more about like Pache says, you know, it's just so complicated and all these moving parts and, you know, who really knows why people prefer one platform over another? It's it's just really hard to pin that down. Uh, but one thing's for sure, it's, it's a lot more going on than is immediately uh, obvious. Uh, let's see what else. Digital rhetoric and digital identity. Yeah, we talked about this a lot. Yeah, they say... Uh, yeah, you know, the original people, if you read the early stuff about writing for the web and blogging and all that, they, they make a big deal about how, uh, well, this is very liberating, you know, because race, you know, what, what, whether you're a person of color or not, whatever gender you are and so on and, and so forth, your, your age, you know, they said, uh, that doesn't matter anymore because you know, if it's online, uh, nobody knows that stuff anyway. <laughs> so it's, it's a non-issue. Uh, that was the, you know, the myth, I guess, that got quickly busted. And people were saying, no, that does, that's just not true at all. Uh, and, and for lots of different reasons, again, we don't really have time to get into all of it. It's fairly complicated and <laughs> a lot to be said on that topic. Um, but that is a, you know, big uh, topic of research. A lot of people have written about that. Yeah, here, I think Warnick, this is Barbara Warnick again. 
uh, and she's writing there about ethos. Remember, ethos is one of those Aristotelian concepts, and that is your credibility. And some of the uh, classical rhetoric rhetoricians will say that the ethos depends on the what's known about the speaker, right? And they'll talk about, you know, uh, somebody who's known to be honest. You know, Isocrates, there's, there or was a yeah, Quintilian rather. <laughs> <laughs> you had this notion called the good person speaking well. You know, the, the good rhetor uh, who speaks well. And you wonder, why do they care about whether you're good or not? You know what? Couldn't you be a, a villain? <laughs> Couldn't you be a thoroughly despicable person and, and still write a really good speech? Uh, but the argument was, no, that wouldn't really work because everybody would know. If you have this terrible reputation, uh, nobody's going to listen to you. It's, it's basically going to taint uh, your message, because they happen to know uh, you're a terrible person. <laughs> and so the uh, rhetoric and, and morality kind of go hand in hand. Because uh, if you want to be a good speaker, that means you have to live a good life. Uh, otherwise, nobody will take you seriously. They will know that you're a, uh, a ne'er-do-well, uh, so to speak, and not, not take you seriously. Uh, okay, uh, so what Warnick is saying here is that there was another view, though, that ethos was just built it was, it was in the speech it was the quality of the speech itself so again saying it wouldn't matter who wrote the speech you could just set that aside and just look at the quality of the argument you know that this being laid out there in front of you and matter of fact in logic and you know, they talk about the uh, you know the attack on, on the person right the ad hominem attack you know just uh you know maybe you're making good points but you know hey <laughs> uh, didn't you go to prison or or didn't you do this or that and try to discredit your character as a way to discredit your argument. Uh, so, uh, you know, what Warnick is saying there is some of the same, some of that same material applies, of course, to uh, uh, online writing. You know, you can talk to students about, uh, you know, let's just look at the text and the way this argument is composed. Uh, I mean, it might be a way to think about ethos in these modern contexts because, you know, again, with things being so fluid. Let's see, where are we with this? Uh, yeah, and then Bay, who is this Bay? Uh, Jennifer Bay, 2010. Uh, so she's talking in there about how, you know, it, it's, you probably thought about this too, how a lot of the more modern things like YouTube and increasingly the different kinds of chats, uh, it's not just text. You know, a lot of this is video. I mean, we think about Zoom. Uh, so again, you can't really say that on Zoom, it wouldn't make sense to say, well, on Zoom, it doesn't really matter, you know, gender and, and, and race and so on and so forth are irrelevant, uh, you know, because it's a video. <laughs> and so your body is kind of relevant uh, in ways in, these, in some of these uh, platforms. So that, you know, might, maybe, I don't know, early days of the Internet when it was just text mostly. Um, you know, I think we could agree at least that it makes it more, at least it's more visible. <laughs> <laughs> or more obvious how these things are relevant uh, in something like Zoom uh, than it would be back in those MUDs, which are like text. If you can imagine like World of Warcraft, uh, but everything is text. There's no graphics. Uh, that's what they mean by MUDs or MOOs. Sometimes you see those. Uh, it's that same sort of uh, concept. All right, let's see what else we have here. Again, I know, big, big chapter. And yeah, there he's talking about these, these spines again, or bots as I like to call them. Uh, then he gets into like network theory and network rhetoric, and that's a you know an academic discipline all in on all in itself. Networks, you can have uh, electronic networks, but they they have more general systems of networks where they look at things like nodes and links and everything from studying ants and bees uh, all the way up to uh, you know communication, uh, how communication happens, uh, you know all these moving parts, the assemblages of people, technology, and social norms. Uh, so you can apply some of that theory to kind of help us understand. Uh, you, you know, you can look at it scientifically purely, uh, but also rhetorically. You know, one of the ways I look at this and kind of bring this together, well, there's a couple ways. Uh, uh, you know, it talks in here a lot about circulation and how things uh, circulate throughout a, an ecosystem, uh, to use his term, or you think about a, like Twitterverse. <laughs> uh, you can get likes on your tweets. If somebody likes your tweet, they might retweet it, which means that they, you know, they have their own little group of followers. Uh, so if you post something, they might retweet it. 
goes out to their followers and then their followers might retweet it and like it. So you could think about that in terms of like this network, you know, that original node and then people retweeting and I always kind of think about like a molecule <laughs> uh, like system it kind of looks to me like those or, or tinker toys, you know, going out and some of the pieces are bigger. And, you know, some of the posts get a lot of retweets, a lot of likes. You know, so that in a way kind of shows uh, you, you could say, well, that tweet that got like 100 likes and, uh, you know, 50 retweets. You know, they must, you know, we could look at that as uh, there's something rhetorical there. You know, it's, it's more persuasive because it got so many of those likes and retweets, right? It's kind of, you come back to the ethos again. Uh, you kind of think there must be something there. Uh, you know, it, it got a lot of attention. Uh, there, there must be something to it, right? It, it kind of uh, is impressive in a way that one that didn't get any kind of retweets or likes just doesn't seem to carry that, that, that power with it. All right, then they, what is this, the protocol? Yes, networks by their mere existence are not liberating. They exercise novel forms of control uh, that operate at a level that is anonymous and non-human. And so they're thinking there, I guess, about everything from, you know, whether or not you can even get on the website. You know, you can have these apps that are, incom that are not compatible with other apps. Uh, there are ways to exclude certain apps, you know. The, the, I always think about just internet protocols. <laughs> you know, how do you, uh, when I think about a protocol, I typically think about a form of, a, you know, acceptable behavior, right? Like, what, what is the protocol for this situation uh, where you're supposed to do this and this and this? And if you don't do that way, then you'll be uh, excluded. Uh, just a kind of an example of this off the top of my head. Not really anything to do with that. <laughs> and to lose in Guattari, maybe, but um, <clears throat> uh, when you're trying to play one of these online games, uh, you know, there's a way to comport yourself such that you'll be accepted into groups and, you know, people won't mess with you, basically. Uh, but if you're not a aware of those protocols, right, you might be accused of being a, a novice or a noob. Uh, people won't watch you uh, in the groups, you know, and so on. Uh, so, uh, it's kind of a different example than what they're talking about there. Um, it just kind of makes more sense to me. Yeah, and the same thing here with these networked publics. So, yeah, I think this concept of the network publics is good because it, again, brings us back to the idea that they're, they're these people. <laughs> you're, you're talking about people, not just technologies. You come back to my online gaming example. You know, you, there's no reason... It wouldn't really matter how you, what kind of technology you were using, what game it was. Uh, you know, people talk about some of these online communities being really toxic, or they'll say this one is very, uh, very welcoming, or uh, you know, very open. And you know, you got to realize that's <laughs> probably has less to do with the actual tech technology, the, the the game controllers they're using, or anything like that, and, and more to do with these particular publics, this particular group of people. Yeah, the key word is <laughs> relationships. Now he's talking there again about these, using this ecological metaphor. You know, if you think about an ecosystem, you know, everything from the bugs, you know, the, the things eat the, or the bugs, I guess, spread the pollen, and, this, and then the birds eat the bugs and spread the seeds and, you know, so on and so forth. And everything kind of plays a role. Uh, and you can't really isolate those, any one of those elements, because the only way to really understand that uh, creature, that bug or whatever, you have to know a lot more about the system as a whole to figure out what is this, you know, what is that mosquito? Does that mosquito <laughs> have, an, have a role to play in the ecosystem? You know, maybe it does. I, I sure hope it doesn't. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we could look at this, you know, even with something like, um, you know, these games again, uh, there's an argument that, uh, you know, I, I study a lot of video games and online games and, uh, coming back to this idea of the toxic communities, uh, there's people that say we should just get rid of the, uh, well, they, they call them griefers. Like these people, there's people that play these games and they basically, don't, they do nothing, but they're unpleasant. You know, they, they're insulting. <laughs> you know, they're just kind of uh, jerks, basically. You know, can't we just, you know, wouldn't the game be better if we just uh, blocked those people or, or deleted them, basically, you know, prevented them from even playing the game? Uh, 
And so they've, they've studied that sort of thing from this, using these sort of ecological models and, and find that, well, you know, in bizarre ways, you know, the game, uh, you know, they actually play a role in, in this ecosystem. I mean, arguably, I'm not saying I agree or disagree with it, um, but, you know, people that, there have been people that argue, for example, that the, uh, you know, that, that they, <laughs> I don't even really understand the arguments, to be uh, frank with you, but. You know, I guess they feel like that kind of makes the game more interesting uh, to some people. Or it's more entertaining. Uh, or the people talk about the game more. <laughs> you know, personally, I just think that I don't like those people. <clears throat> All right. Uh, yeah, and here's just some more things. So we're, we're going to talk about um, Larry Lessig at a certain point in this course. I'm going to read a Free Culture. This will come back up. Uh, but another... Um, thing that makes digital rhetoric kind of interesting compared to some of these other forms is the idea of remixing. So we can, especially if it's a digital form, it's easy to copy and paste things, but you can also do these things called mashups. Uh, you can make videos that have, you know, scenes from video games, like they're talking here about World of Warcraft and the Guild Wars music video, uh, where they actually, I guess, did some screen recordings and they kind of made it into a video. Uh, so it's a lot easier to kind of take a little bit of this, a little bit of that thing over there, you kind of mash it up into this new thing uh, it's called a remix or mashup. And that's got its own, you know, they call about a, talk about it as a digital practice there. And so again, it's something very interesting and cool to get into. You know, like what is the, you know, how do we better understand that sort of thing? He always comes back to his ecology metaphor. What is useful, however, is the articulation of how both information and genres function within complex networks of interaction, how they interact within specific ecosystems. And one of the things that I think about there is these uh, memes. And there's something called an, a meme stock. <laughs> you might have heard about this. <laughs> and there's a site called Reddit. And there's a subreddit of Reddit called the Wall Street Bets. And uh, this Wall Street Bets... You know, talk about a, a questionable ecosystem. You know? A lot of vulgarity, a lot of uh, nasty stuff gets posted there, but a lot of these uh, memes get posted there too. So what people will do, they'll take these funny memes, you know, a chicken, a rooster, a dancing kid at a disco attack or, or whatever it is. And so they'll take these, uh, you know, these memes from, I don't know why, I have no clue what the original context of that <laughs> thing was. <laughs> uh, but they'll take it and they'll put it into this, into these uh, discussions on Reddit, uh, you know, to try to talk about a stock, and you're like, it's just to tell you, that it's just so bizarre, <laughs> it's almost surreal. <laughs> you're like, I thought we were, you know, having a discussion here about, you know, a particular stock and whether this, you know, the company's fundamentals are good or bad, or you know, what what's the uh, perspective look like. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you posting this, you know, this uh, GIF, animated GIF of a dancing kid? I, you know, what the heck is going on? <laughs> uh, you know, so it's kind of, you know, you don't know what to make of it sometimes. You really have to, again, think, yeah, thinking about this like an ecosystem, uh, you know, that's got some role to play, this dancing kid. You know, you've seen that like a hundred times, and there's another one. Uh, these French comedians doing their pomp it and dump, dump it. <laughs> uh, so where did, you know, what was the original context for that stuff? Who knows? You know, it's, it's almost as unfathomable sometimes as, you know, thinking about these really complex ecosystems like the planet. And there's, there's plants and bugs and you know, talk about endangered species. And one of the reasons why we care about, you know, these species is frankly, you know, we don't know. You know, that, that owl, uh, spotted owl or whatever, you know, creature this is, uh, that might have, it might be playing some vital role in this uh, ecosystem that we just don't know. You know, so we better err on the side of caution, <laughs> you know, and try to protect it. Uh, you know, so in some ways, maybe the, you know, if the, if Reddit, for whatever reason, were to say, we need to cancel memes, you know, and not let people post these memes anymore, uh, that might do some damage. You know, because we really, you know, we don't quite understand yet <laughs> what role that thing is playing, uh, that, that gif or whatever the case is. And all we can really do is try to study it. And obviously this idea of how it circulates throughout the network is, is part of that 
uh, process. Yeah, the economies of circulation. And we kind of touched on this already, but this idea of the, the cultural, you know, Bordeaux there, Bordeaux, uh, talking about cultural capital, social capital. Uh, so a lot of people talk about the capital just meaning money. You know, if you got a lot of capital, you know, you might, let's just say you had a million dollars. Well, that's, you know, one type of capital. Uh, but there's other types of capital, like your, how much you know, your, your intellect, your, you know, if you've, if you've read every great novel, <laughs> you know, that there's, there's some value in that. You know, it kind of makes you more valuable uh, in, in interesting kind of ways to think about uh, that you have the a command of that literature. You, know, you could say that's a social capital there. And we could also look at that sort of concept again in terms of uh, this online uh, material. You know, how does it circulate? How many tweets? How many retweets? They talked in here about an MA thesis. And this is something I wrote about my dissertation, actually. It's kind of fun to see this example used. But, you know, you got these students that work on this thesis all these years, sometimes, or at the very least, uh, a year of their life has gone into this thesis. <laughs> And then it just gets uh, put into a library, maybe nowadays a database somewhere in the library. And and, no, and maybe it's kind of locked up so nobody ever sees it unless you go to the library or you have uh, access to the, to the database. Uh, so you'd say that's kind of limiting. You know, it would be better if we could make it available uh, so other people could read it, maybe quote it easier, cite it a little bit easier. You know, academics are, are very used to this idea of people quoting and citing their work. It's kind of how the academic model works. But you don't see it as much in you know, the popular works because they, <laughs> they're a lot more restrictive in terms of copyrights and licensing and, you know, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, you know, maybe that needs to be re-looked at. You know, in this digital age, maybe we, the copyright law doesn't make much sense anymore or needs to be uh, revised. Okay, just about an hour. <laughs> so my apologies, this went kind of long, but again, it's a long chapter, a lot of material. Uh, but hopefully this kind of cleared up a few things or maybe gave you some things, fun things to think about. At least that's my hope. Uh, but I will stop it here and uh, let me know if you have any questions or comments. Love to hear those and I'll see you next time.